Nice, yeah. You just pissed off the final <laughs> camp of people. Now there's <laughs> no one listening. <laughs> it's just yeah. you and I. Welcome to episode 10 of Increments. Uh, Vaden, I see you have um, the book A Portrait of the Artist of, as a Young Man uh, listed on your very nicely, newly formatted website. Can you explain to me what the fuck's going on with that book? Why do people like it so much? It's just like dense and not well written and quite confusing. Oh, dude. Like what? what? It's, it's yeah. amazing. So uh, that's James Joyce and that's the um, book he wrote that uh, introduces the characters in Ulysses. And so I included it because uh, Ulysses is one of the most incredible books I've ever uh, read. And in order to appreciate Ulysses, you have to read Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and you have to read like Homer's Odyssey. Um, <laughs> and so they all uh, uh, are referencing e each other. But yeah, it, it's it's not like a book you just crack open, read it from the beginning to the end. It's more one that you study and um, uh, spend time with it because you can't it's 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 not an easy book to read, but it's it's definitely worth worth reading. Okay, yeah, I was I'm sitting there reading it. And I'm just like, there's so many other good authors I could be reading right now. I was like, give me some Nabokov or some Dostoevsky or something. But this is it was just painful. Yeah. So anyway, I noticed that so many people like it and listed yeah. as one of their favorite books. So that's, I was just that's what. Well, yeah, I'm glad you're checking out my new my new website. I spent like a good week just trying to up update the thing and yeah, uh, purple font, very stylish, very stylish. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, anyway, so what are we talking about this? Uh, episode we're talking about tradition so this is the first episode in our ongoing series on conjectures and refutations and we've chosen why don't we choose this episode uh, i think you had suggested it um uh, yeah i think there was there's some public conversation right now about i think the role of tradition or at least about the role of statues and whatnot and this sort of alludes to the role of hmm. tradition itself so i just figured this would be a good one to to kick off our series hmm. with yeah um but yeah so I, I really enjoyed it so we talk about um, a bunch of stuff in the essay. So I'll, in the show notes, I'll actually link to the, the essay um, because nothing we say will substitute for just reading it. But, uh, but so we cover, say, the left and the right and their view of tradition. Um, and then Popper is going to develop a new theory of tradition that uh, unifies the, the two views. Um, we cover the role of sociological theories in general and conspiracy theories and group psychology. We get into a fun argument about that. Um, and then the role of the scientific tradition. And uh, yeah, so I just thought it was a great conversation. Uh, and yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up briefly was actually an interview I heard between uh, Rob Wiblin and Jennifer Doliak on um, like pr police brutality and just what what we sort of know about like police union and police violence and stuff. We talked a little bit in the defund the police episode about for those of us like interested in the problem and who are protesting it in various ways, it's very important to actually keep up with any new information in the field and what's being done and what's working, what's not working. And so I just thought this, um, this interview was like a very sober and rigorous analysis of like exactly what we know, didn't pretend to know more than we didn't. Um, and just really laid the facts bare about like what the problems are. Uh, if we know that there are solutions at this point and what directions uh, policies are, are moving us. So I'll put that in the show notes, but highly encourage people to, check out that episode and the episode right before it actually where um rob also interviews uh james foreman jr who wrote an excellent book on the subject of um policing and, and crime in the u.s locking up our own uh, is the name of his book what was the name of the podcast again i, I missed that so this is the eighty thousand hours podcast uh, excellent and so the, yeah so the last two episodes in particular were very good so i'll link those but for yeah for those of us interested in in this problem i think it's just very important to gather as much information about what we know is working and what's not yeah um which is like sort of a, a duty of sorts so, yeah like and so before we play the episode one tiny correction i think i mentioned at some point that two episodes um have passed with stephen haynes our guest uh one of those episodes is coming after we release this one because we're still doing some editing. So uh, you didn't miss anything. It's coming next, but I mentioned uh, that. Uh, cool. I think we should just uh, play the show. Let's do it. Sweet. I thought one place we could maybe begin is um, with this stupid party story that I would tell that I think is going to lead us into uh, the subject. It's, um, it's the five monkeys in the ladder experiment. Have you heard this one? No, I haven't laid on me. So, uh, you put five monkeys in a room, um, and you 
put a ladder and a banana at the top of the ladder. Um, okay. And uh, eventually one of the monkeys climbs up the ladder to get the banana. And then the experimenter uh, sprays that monkey and all the other monkeys with water and uh, knocks the monkey off the, the ladder, um, such that all the monkeys learn that you're not supposed to touch the banana. You can't get the banana. Um, okay. So then they take one of the monkeys out and they put a new monkey in who's never been sprayed. And the, that monkey starts to climb up and then all the other monkeys attack it. Oh. Um, and attack the monkey because they don't want to be sprayed with water. And so that monkey f- comes back down. And then you take another monkey out and put the new monkey in. And you do the same thing such that all the monkeys learn that you're supposed to attack um, the monkey climbing up the ladder. But none of the monkeys have been sprayed with water. And Oh, fascinating. Uh, the idea is that this is where traditions come from. Um, where... I don't know why I'm supposed to take off my hat when I sit at the dinner table, but all the other monkeys around the dinner table are going to attack me if I wear a hat. Um, and so if the banana isn't a banana, but it's say some, some book and we all learn that if you uh, say criticize this book, uh, we're going to get attacked, then certain traditions are going to form, form around this. Um, so this was, so ter- this is an experiment that, uh, it didn't actually happen. I think I fact checked it before, for the podcast, but, um, but it, it's a useful, I think, first attempt at a theory of how traditions form. And what Popper is going to do in this essay, so the essay is called uh, Towards a Rational Theory of Tradition, is he's going to find that that theory, um, which was essentially mine coming into this essay, is rather inadequate to explain um, this complex phenomenon of uh, traditions. And so the subject for today is is, uh, tradition, and we're going to use this as the first chapter in an ongoing series on conjectures and refutations. And so I thought the way that like it might be nice to begin is, is just give it a quick outline of the structure of this chapter um, and then contextualize it into the structure of the overall book. Because last week you, or pardon me, um, a couple episodes ago when we announced uh, our series, uh, you gave an excellent summary of conjectures and refutations, but then uh, two episodes have passed with having Stephen Haynes on, and so I thought it'd be my, nice to just uh, kind of summarize and start start fresh from, from this episode. So conjectures and refutations is Popper's attempt to understand how knowledge is produced and how science uh, works. His whole thesis is that knowledge is produced through this simple mechanism of uh, guessing how the world works and then checking those guesses, where checking counterintuitively is not about proving that your guess is correct, but trying to find errors in your guess. And this is what is slightly counterintuitive to people when they first hear this, because they think science is all about proving hypotheses, but it's not about that. It's about um, falsifying hypotheses. Um, So that's going to be the through line for a lot of the uh, material in this book. Uh, And so as we develop this series more, um, the implications of this small idea will become clear. But in this episode, we're going to talk about his uh, theory of tradition. And so what he's going to do is he's going to First, give two, let's say, differing accounts of tradition. One I kind of expressed with this um, silly monkey story, where rationalists think of traditions as uh, mm-hmm. just a bunch of monkeys fighting over a banana. And this would be my, let's say, view coming into this essay, that like I'm not interested in tradition. I want to judge ideas on their own merit, and I want to be independent of any tradition because I want to judge it with my own brain, and I'm a rational person. And the other poll would be the one expressed by Edmund Burke, most famously, the um, kind of the, the founder of modern conservatism, who says that uh, tradition is something that you just have to accept. You just have to take it and accept it. You can't rationalize it. It's this. Uh, it's something you're just given. It's bequeathed to you. And um, all you can do is uh, understand its importance and kind of succumb to the, the power of tradition. So these are the two polls. One says you can either take it or take it approach. Um, and the other is like, I mean, they're going to leave it or I'm going to leave it. And Popper is going to find both of these inadequate. And then he's going to do a close analysis of one tradition in particular, uh, and that's the scientific tradition. And so that's going to be the connection to uh, the overall thesis of, of, of the book. In order to demonstrate the inadequacy of these two views, he's going to put forth a tentative new theory of tradition. And this new theory is going to accept the valid criticisms of both of the two poles, but it's going to do a lot more interesting things. And so in order to develop the theory, he's going to have to start talking about the role of sociological theories in general, uh, because any theory of tradition has to be a theory uh, that comes from the school of sociology, uh, the study of societies and, and human beings. And so that's going to lead him into a discussion of 
the importance uh, and the role of sociological theories. And that's also going to um, then lead to some sociological theories that have gone wrong. So uh, conspiracy theories. Um, so in this essay, which we're going to go into in detail, um, there's going to be a bunch of subjects touched. Conspiracy theories, the role of society, uh, uh, sociological theories in general, and then uh, a new theory of the scientific tradition. Um, and so as we go into the details, I want listeners to hopefully keep in mind uh, where he's going with this and why it matters into the larger uh, uh, project of, of the book. And so that would be my, my introduction to this subject. And yeah, so. <laughs> that was a fantastic summary. I, I have very little to add uh, beyond the fact that I'm sure you are going to be thrown out of decent circles now that you have given an example of an experiment, even though it's hypothetical, of monkeys being thrown down ladders. So now the animal rights folks will be pissed at you. <laughs> and you made you you made a reference to religion in talking about your book. And so you've just pissed off two huge groups of people. Well, and so, don't forget about um, the banana lobby who doesn't want their... <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's game over for them. And so I guess the only thing to add here is that Popper is interested in how we make progress and how we generate knowledge. Um, he's, t he's looking at tradition and its role in society via this lens. And so, you know, why, why is this important? I think everyone kind of knows. I think tradition is pretty relevant right now. Um, and I think it's, it's having a fairly hard time at the moment. I think there are those who think tradition is sort of worthless, doesn't have anything to teach us, and is simply um, a bunch of arbitrary rules put in place by old uh, white men and that we should just like discard mm -hmm. the entire thing. And so that's not necessarily wrong, but I think we have to be a little more subtle in our analysis of tradition here. And so that's that's kind of what we're going to do. Um, and so I get, yeah, I'd just like to open, I guess, with a thought experiment of my own, or not of my my own, but rather of like G.K. Chesterton. So have you heard of Ch uh, Chesterton's fence? Yes, hundred percent I have. Yeah, yeah. So this is, I think, another good intro um, that doesn't involve throwing monkeys <laughs> monkeys down ladders of <laughs> of the role of tradition. Yeah. So you, the thought experiment is as follows: You're you know walking across a field and you just come across a fence and. There's no one around, you're looking at this fence, and you can't figure out what it's for. And the two poles that you mentioned, the traditionalist and uh, the rationalist, are going to have two very different reactions to this. So the traditionalist says, you have to take the existence of this fence seriously, right? It was there for a reason. Whoever put it there obviously had a reason to do so. And therefore, you can only begin to start questioning its existence once you understand its its origins. Whereas the rationalist response is, look, like you said, I'm not interested in the origins of this fence. I am here right now and I can't see its use. And therefore, I can tell that it's not used for anything. I'm going to tear this fence down. I don't care where it came from. Its history is completely irrelevant to, to why the fence is here right now. And I'm going to trust in my own reason to... Um, to tell me that this fence is playing no important role and, and therefore I'm going to get rid of it. Um, you know, replace the fence with any sort of institution or societal tradition and you have what has, you know, began as a silly, silly thought experiment to two fundamental ideas for how to look at reform and the role of tradition in society, right? So you identify the tradition traditionalist view as sort of originating, or at least being captured very well by sort of you know, the Burkean conservative. And beyond, I think, just believing that you can't rationalize it, and that you just need to understand its significance and, and accept it, I think the traditionalist almost imbues tradition with like a special sort of aura that you're almost incapable of understanding, mm. right? Tradition takes on this role outside of reason, almost like no matter, regardless of how hard you try to understand it, um, it will all be for naught, right? Tradition sort of rises to this this uh, level almost as uh, almost as something religious, right? It's It becomes almost like a dogmatism, whereas the rationalist is completely the opposite, right? If you can't understand it of your own brain, then it has no reason to exist. And we are always um, in the position to make the best call about what's best for society and understand the, the historical precedent for anything is just a, just a waste of time. 
I, so yeah, so the word traditionalist here, I think, is relatively well suited for the current conversation. The word rationalist might be mm. kind of confusing. Okay. So, but instead of trying to maybe just define something, I just like to. Yeah, I think most it might be most helpful to just think of like almost the left and right divide for a number of reasons. I'm not a huge fan of uh, sort of the t- typical uh, left right political spectrum, but in this case, I think it captures these notions relatively well. I think the left people would admit are more hesitant to adopt um, traditions and much more critical Mm -hmm. of them, where I think the right is much more conservative in their outlook, obviously, on on tradition and place a a lot of importance on on traditions and culture. Yeah, I guess just that's all to say, don't be confused when we start using the word uh, rationalist. Uh, It's just those who believe that we can sort of wipe the slate clean and begin afresh and that we can always make things better purely by using our knowledge and our reason in the moment yes. so um, that we don't have to pay attention to history. So um, in the opening uh, uh, paragraphs of this essay, he describes these two poles. And so far what we've said is, I think, leaning fairly heavily towards the, the rationalist camp or the, yeah, let's use the word libertarian or left or, or uh, those who think that um, all traditions are silly. Um, that's, that's all we essentially mean. Right. And he dispenses with this view so quickly with one sentence, which basically says that it's not this simple is simple to see because, um, the rationalists who say this are bound by a tradition, uh, which traditionally says these things. So there's a long tradition of rationalism, a long tradition of the left who by tradition always does away with tradition. Um, and yeah. So a paragraph, which I think crystallizes his view really nicely is the following. So he says, uh, now, I do not think that we could ever free ourselves entirely from the bonds of tradition. The so-called freeing is really only a change from one tradition to another. But we can free ourselves from the taboo of tradition, and we can do that not only by rejecting it, but also by critically accepting it. We free ourselves from taboo if we think about it, and if we can ask ourselves whether we should accept it or reject it. So you see here sort of rejecting both camps, right? On the one hand, he's saying to completely get rid of tradition is sort of nonsensical because... One, even that line of reasoning is a tradition in and of itself, but tradition can play an important role in society. But on the other hand, he's he's sort of rejecting the aura of mystique and importance that the conservative places on the role of tradition. He's rejecting the notion that we can't understand it with our reason, that it's beyond critical examination um, simply because of its role, right? So you can see him already start to sort of walk a line between between these two poles. Yeah. Something to add, add there is um, how important this is to contemporary politics. So let's take the, uh, the gay rights um, movement for, for example, a lot of the progress towards equality had been prevented by those arguing that a marriage is a man and a woman and they have kids. And why is this the case? Because it's always been this way. And this is just what we've always done. God told us this, but th- this is what's normal. This is what's right. Mm-hmm. This is obviously an inadequate view. Uh, and so Popper's point is that you don't need to just like acquiesce to traditions. You can critically examine them. Um, you can think, is this a tradition worth pushing forward or is it something we need to change? And obviously in the case of, of marriage equality, it is something we needed to change. Um, but then you could take another instance. You could take, say, the, the tendency of some feminists in the 80s and 90s to issue the tradition of say shaving their legs and this was this is a tradition which they didn't want to be bound by but then by issuing this tradition they start a new tradition of feminists not shaving their legs this is obviously a stereotype but it just shows that even those who take a radical view of traditions and say i will not be bound by it can't help but create a new tradition uh, uh themselves <laughs> and so there's so there's no escaping the this uh series of traditions all there is is critically analyzing them and deciding if if we want to swap one tradition, say the tradition of marriage being between uh, males and females, um, with a better tradition, which is marriage be between any two consenting adults. And so in this way, uh, he's already starting to unify the two perspectives. Um, and I just wanted to, to provide two nice. contemporary examples of, of what you're saying. Nice. Yeah. You just pissed off the final <laughs> camp of people. Now there's <laughs> no one listening. <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. you and I. Um, okay. Yeah. So good. So you cite a couple examples. I think that would actually be a good place to start because I think when people think of tradition normally, we think of like religious dogma 
or oppression of one group by another that's just been going on. We think of like sacrificing idols um, in earlier times, uh, or perhaps like even something slightly more relevant, like circumcision, both like male and female. That's a tradition that um, I think is increasingly coming on, under fire for good reason, I think. Um, and so these are sort of traditions that I think that the leftist or the rationalist is saying, you know, pointing this out and saying, this is absurd, right? Obviously, we could do better than this if we just sit down and think about it. But to try and like, examine the benefits of tradition for a second. You know, tradition, it allows us to engage with ideas and communities without having to sort of explicitly redefine the rules of conduct always, or requiring that each member understand the purpose of every activity yeah, undertaken by the group. Um, so it, it, tradition in Popper's language in this way can confer a sort mm. of knowledge, right? And so to give some concrete examples of, of what I'm yammering about here, so one is like the scientific tradition. So, you know, in, in the, we not all graduate students or, you know, professors for that matter need to take courses in epistemology or be experts at the philosophy of science in order to contribute to scientific progress, right? Because they're just ensconced in the tradition of of the scientific method, they they sort of make progress without explicitly having to think about like, okay, how is this working? How is like how does incrementalism play a role? in uh, the progression of knowledge and stuff, right? And um, another example might be like the democratic tradition or the tradition of free speech. So instead of each de generation generation having to uh, sit down and think really hard about what forms of government are optimal or having to undergo social experiments involving autocracy and tyranny, right? We can, we sort of, we sort of confer the knowledge of the benefits of dem democracy one, one generation to, to the other. And now we're in a generation that's like barely seen war, right? Especially for us in North America. And so, but we still have, we have this idea in our heads about why democracy is so good. So this is a tradition, right? It's a democratic tradition that is conferring a specific sort of knowledge, which, which is useful. Um, we have sort of the tradition of like, of human rights. Um, and I think I view rights as sort of encoding values that we've realized often in very difficult ways, um, what are valuable and what, what, what um, confers well-being onto humans, right? And then and then once we realize that, oh, in general, this rule is a really good idea, we sort of codify it into this language of rights and then pass it on to ne the next generations. And I think we see this right now, right? Like, our, especially our generation, we talk a lot in terms of rights, like what are rights of certain groups? We want to give people equality in terms of rights. And for good or for ill, the level of analysis actually rarely goes beyond the the rights discourse, right? <laughs> it's it's almost unacceptable to start asking, okay, where do but where did the right come from? Like, does does everyone actually have this right? Right? Once you start asking that, you sort of enter you enter dangerous territory. So for those who are big supporters of rights, this is a tradition which is like very important, mm -hmm. right? And allows us to to criticize. Uh, certain, w whether it's cultures or countries who are taking away rights mm -hmm. from certain people. Um, and, uh, and then I just thought, you know, a funner example of like where tradition is just completely apolitical, but very useful is, is drum circles. So I played the drums for a number of years and, um, there was like a specific pattern played in a typical drum circle, which, uh, marks sort of the beginnings, endings and transitions of songs, um. And so this may vary slightly from circle to circle, but, you know, what this does is allow people to engage uh, with the music of a new circle without having to even, like, speak the language of the people there, right? Without having to sit down with them beforehand and define the rules of conduct. Okay, how are we going to know when, when it's your turn to solo, my turn to solo? And presumably this is a similar in, like, jazz and other kinds of music. So this is a tradition that we definitely want to hold yeah. on to, right? If we, if we think about tradition as being a, a method of passing on implicit knowledge... So later in, in this series, there's going to be a distinction between like explicit and implicit knowledge. Um, and implicit mm -hmm. knowledge is uh, the way that I found um, is the most effective at communicating implicit knowledge. It would be if, if you tell a joke um, and then you have to explain why that joke is funny to somebody. Um, <laughs> the amount of time it will take you to explain in words why the joke is funny. Um, just next time you hear a joke, uh, try to explain why it's funny. And what you'll find... Jerry yeah. Seinfeld's weatherman <laughs> or something, right? You got to understand what the purpose of the yeah, weatherman yeah. And, is and that they just make odd and, movements. And on so, the yeah, so to, to explain a joke is to ruin a joke, but to explain a joke is to also unearth a lot of the implicit knowledge, which uh, we have that isn't often codified in symbols, but we just know it and are able to move through the world using it. Uh, mm -hmm. A second example of implicit knowledge would, would be definitions. Um, if, if I ask you to define the word the 
most people will have a difficult time coming up with an explicit definition of the word the, but they'll know how to use it. They'll know how to use it and they'll know when it's used incorrectly. Um, and they'll know uh, if, if somebody is, is just learning language and um, they'll have a difficult time explaining explicitly why it's wrong, but they will still be able to, to mm -hmm. um, indicate if it's right or wrong, uh, used correctly or incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, so with traditions, this is one way to pass on this explicit, uh, excuse me, uh, implicit knowledge. A uh, key example that I like is just um, greeting rituals. So now that COVID is around, in Vancouver at least, the standard way that you greet people is through hugs. Um, you hug people hello and hug people goodbye. Um, other cultures, it's mm. fist bumps. Other cultures, it's like a fist bump turned into a hug and handshakes. And there's all sorts of different greeting rituals. Um, but right now, none of us know what the appropriate greeting ritual is. So this tradition, we're in the transition between traditions. And it makes greetings and exits a little bit less comfortable than it should be because we don't have this implicit knowledge, this tradition of uh, greeting rituals anymore. And so this is what it means to accept a tradition critically versus uh, uncritically. It's to think, what am I doing that I'm doing because other people are doing it? And why am I doing it? And is the reason that I'm doing it valuable um, or is it not valuable? Uh, this is to, to critically analyze traditions. One other point which I think should be made is that most traditions are just unacknowledged and unconscious. Um, wearing a watch on our left mm. hand versus our right hand, or the fact that I wear uh, pants typically in the winter, I don't wear a kilt. I could be wearing a kilt. There's no reason. <laughs> it's completely arbitrary that I don't wear kilts. I wear pants. Um, why do I wear pants? Because everybody else around me wears pants. And I don't want to think about what I'm going to wear from the set of all possible clothing choices that have ever been invented. I just want to quickly choose something and, and get on with my day. And so there's um, this is this other uh, aspect of traditions, which I think is uh, important, is that often they go unnoticed. So, yeah, I mean, one uh, one point I want to make is... The Popper's explanation of why tradition is valuable really boils down to his notion of humans as falsifiable, or as, as uh, fallible, rather, as falsifiable. <laughs> as, uh, uh, Vaden, you have been falsified. <laughs> as fallible. So, um, you know, there are, when we take an action, and we implement a policy, whatever, there are always unintended and often sort of unwarranted consequences of our action. And traditions can thus serve to encode valuable knowledge that we don't have to think about again and again. Um, and so that we don't have to make the same mistakes over and over again and again. We don't have to relearn each generation or each person doesn't have to relearn the same mistakes, right? And uh, so Steve, Stephen Pinker actually... I believe makes this point where he says, this is a paraphrase, but he says sort of, we make progress because sometimes we try things and occasionally they work, they make things better. And so, and then occasionally we remember what we did to make things better. Right. <laughs> and so in this way, we're just sort of incrementally moving forward and traditions try and yeah, encode this knowledge. But then the important point is, simply because they have encoded knowledge in the past does not make them beyond analysis. It does not make them beyond criticism. Um, and they can encode um, uh, false knowledge or they can encode things not because it's knowledge, but because it disables people's critical faculties. So mm, this is something yes. which Deutsch builds on in uh, his book on the evolution of culture. Um, and this is not present in this in Popper's work, but it's Deutsch continuing this theory. And he, he says that there are essentially two kinds of, of memes or two kinds of behaviors which can be passed on. One is passed on because uh, it encodes something true and useful. Greeting rituals would be something that's very useful. Um, the tradition of, say, uh, teaching students mathematics can be uh, useful. But then there's another kind of tradition which is passed on, another kind of meme, what Deutsch would say, which is passed on because it disables people's ability to mm -hmm. think critically. And examples of this tend to come more from, from religion, uh, but I won't... I won't enumerate examples here because most people can. I'd like to actually, uh, I'd put own. a provocative mm. example of this on the table, which I'm not mm. sure if I agree mm. with, but is the, actually the, the role of like meritocracy, especially in the U S. Mm. Um, and so I think people are brought up to think like being awarded based on merit is, is very good. Um, and so when a society tries to encode these values, this is a good thing and shouldn't be criticized. But I think what this, um, ignores is the fact that people are not starting on an equal footing, right? So people, mm. there's some people who just start with much more privilege, much more time, much um, more intelligence than other people. And so I think this kind of encodes this false faith in the equality of a system 
that is not quite there. Mm. And I think you can you can see this sort of tradition playing out, uh, especially on the right right now, when they're mm. sort of very critical of things like affirmative action or redistribution and things like this. Mm. And so anyway, I'm not sure if I entirely agree with that, but I think that's that's one example where I think the leftist is is quite on point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bookmark that because we should do a whole episode on meritocracy because I, I still don't know how I feel about it. Mm. Um, but I also I think that because I am mainly in lefty circles and I consider myself um, on the left, I don't encounter this meritocratic uh, tradition very often. I see. Yeah. Um, and if by meritocratic you mean things like um, publishing papers say, uh, then that could be viewed as meritocracy, but uh, that I have a tough time understanding what people mean when they say meritocracy. And therefore I think I have a tough time arguing in favor or against, against it. Uh, conflated with meritocracy is say reputation and, um, just uh, passion for one's work, which leads to merits, whether or not one values merits in the first place. Yeah. Um, if, if one just genuinely loves playing soccer, um, and then is awarded a trophy at the end of a soccer game. Uh, is it because they're brought up in a meritocratic system or is it because they just love playing soccer so much uh, that they are really good at it? Um, I have a tough time teasing all this out. And, and so this might actually lead to the conspiracy. No, no, that's, that's unfair. I'm not going to say it's a conspiracy <laughs> yeah, yeah. theory or anything, but, but, it, but it is positing a force that is a causal force for a lot of what we see. Um, Perhaps, yeah. And... I'm, I'm more using it in the sense of like the American dream, or that you can achieve anything you want if you ha if you if your work ethic is uh, mm. big enough. You know, if you work hard, you you can achieve. You can make those millions. And if you are unlucky or you're out of a job right now, you have simply failed to work hard enough, and it is mm. Um, mm. no fault of anyone's but but your own. Mm. So I'm using it more as a critique of this uh, yeah traditional view of just you know hard work will get you there. And uh, there's, yeah, nothing keeping anyone down more than anyone else. Excellent. So let's let's um, not pivot, but let's continue, I guess. So we're about, I don't know, a third into the uh, chapter mm -hmm. or so. And he so he's enumerated the the reason why this problem isn't simple. And then he says, therefore, a theory of tradition is is needed. Um, but any theory of tradition is almost by definition going to be a sociological theory um, because it is about society in order to discuss like what the point of a theory of tradition is we should start by discussing what the point of uh, any sociological theory is, is and so this is how he's going to start talking about something which at least when i first read it seemed like a digression but then when i reread it it wasn't a digression but but yeah so let's let's move the subject to uh the role of sociological theories and conspiracy theories, uh, because what he's going to do is he's going to start talking about, let's say, false theories, uh, conspiracy theories, and use that as a essentially like a backstop, um, something against which to compare what the true role, what like the proper role, what, what uh, uh, the task of theoretical social science should be. And so uh, I found this this section to be just really, really fascinating. I've set it up. Do you want to say some words? And then I can apply it after that. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll just dive into it, I guess. So yeah. um, he begins discussing the conspiracy theory of society. And so this is a class of theories which posit that all ill is due to someone in power purposefully keeping the rest of society down. Or some group in power. Game. So some or group some, in power. That's the key, group, key thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, that is, that's a good yeah. point. Um, and so this posits that ills in society are a direct result of human action. So that when there's a problem, we can directly trace it back to some negative consequence of the power dynamics hmm. between a group and an individual. So I, I love the way he um, he sets this up, where he says that this is um, the conspiracy theory of society is even more primitive than uh, theism, um, <laughs> and it's akin to uh, Homer's theory of society, where uh, Homer conceived of all events on, say, the battlefields of Troy as being just a reflection of the various conspiracies of the gods on Mount Olympus. Um, and so the line that he uses is, I just, I love it so much. It says, uh, the conspiracy theory of society comes from abandoning God and then asking who will take his place. Uh, 
rather than abandoning the belief that led to the need for gods, you just abandon this one God and then ask who will take his place. Uh, and then the place is going to be filled with uh, powerful groups, so sinister pressure groups who are going to be blamed for having, say, planned the Great Depression or the, um, say, the wage gap between uh, genders or the gap in all sorts of health statistics that we can collect on races in the United States. So the mistake is assuming that everything in society can be explained by asking uh, who wanted it or who benefits from it or who um, who in power seeks to keep their power by having this happen, rather than saying that the task of the social sciences is to explain those things which nobody wants. Nobody wants it. The conspiracy theorist uh, denies themselves this uh, line of inquiry because they fail to recognize that most of societal ills, like the Great Depression or wars or yeah, racial inequity that we still uh, live with today, are things that nobody wants. And they're the they are the unintended consequences of our intentions rather than the intended consequences of our intentions. And so this is what's going to lead him to a discussion of what the task of the um, theoretical social sciences are. Yeah, so again, it's important to, to realize that his notion of why this conspiracy theory of society is so bankrupt is precisely his, again, his notion of fallibility, right? It's because if even if there was a group in power at the top they're act, they cannot foresee all the consequences of their actions. And so things will go wrong. You know, even in the USSR, when they had centralized everything and all power was um, in the hands of those at the top, they had food shortages because they had thrown out the price indicator, right? And they hmm. therefore could not tell... Um, what was in demand at any time. So they were short on milk, but they had too much beef rotting because it didn't. So, but yeah, I mean, I want to return for a few minutes to Popper's conspiracy theory of society because I'm slightly <laughs> dissatisfied with how he handles it. Um, I do think, so he, yeah, he's, he makes some incredibly valid points, but I think he doesn't fully grapple with the way power dynamics between groups can play themselves out right so it is true it is very difficult to have a group on group on top which whether it be the lizard men or obama which are <laughs> completely in control of every facet of our lives and are able to dictate the course of events with 100 percent certainty and accuracy but this doesn't mean that there aren't consequences to having more people in power from a certain group and how these can reinforce themselves over time. I think it's quite clear that when people achieve power, typically people want to hold on to it. Um, and I think he doesn't fully grapple with the way that these dynamics manifest themselves in disadvantages and inequities throughout society. So I feel like he... I'm not sure if it's just because of his terminology, but I felt like there was a bit of a straw man being thrown at the whole conversation of inequity and power dynamics by simply assuming that people thought there was a group on top who was controlling absolutely everything, whereas there can be, I think, shades of gray um, oh, in, ooh, in so between I, utter I, control and, and no control. Let me let me do the classic podcast thing and push back slightly, nice. yeah, um, which is to say, I, th I think in your in your comments uh, there was a, a subtle mistake which was reflected on by popper in like one sentence um, and so you said uh, that he doesn't reflect how groups want to take power but then you switch from groups to people um, and how mm. people when they get get in power they want to maintain power um, and so the mistake is to uh, ascribe human intentions to uh, groups of people um, i don't think in fact groups of people want to take power i think human beings want to take power and the the move of of saying um, so what does he say he says the conspiracy theorist will believe that institutions can be understood completely as a result of conscious design and as to collectives so his word is collectives not groups um, as to collectives he usually ascribes to them a kind of group personality uh, treating them as conspiring agents just as if they were individual men um, and mm -hmm. and so I think the, the the mistake is thinking that because there are Saddam Hussein's and your Stalin's who are power hungry uh, psychopaths. Therefore, groups also act this way. Like it would, I think, be just as accurate to talk about not straight white men, uh, but 
uh, just fathers. <laughs> I would imagine a lot of them are fathers. So you could, you could talk about how fathers want to take over, uh, society. Mm-hmm. Um, you could talk about how there, there is a, a cabal of fathers who are trying to to uh, capture large swaths and then pass legislation that benefit fathers. Uh, but but this is making the same mistake, which is that groups don't exist. There's just human beings, um, and then there's a useful heuristic of sometimes classifying them into different uh, categories for particular ends. Mm-hmm. But one of the ends which I don't think should be. Uh, things which should be avoided is classifying human beings into groups in order to explain power dynamics because power dynamics um, uh, are often post hoc rationalizations to explain societal inequities rather than recognizing that most of these societal inequities are caused by uh, uh, unintended um, uh, consequences. Oh, this is great. Okay, this is good. Yeah, I think uh, the move actually from individuals to groups is completely vindicated just by modern psychology. So I think Popper's thesis mm-hmm. here is just like outdated and falsified. Mm-hmm. I think we we understand very well the role that tribal thinking and cognitive bias and in group thinking plays in modern psychology. We have we know that this plays itself out in the political realm, um, mm-hmm. and we and we know. Um, uh, I'll put a couple of references in the in the show notes, maybe, but we know how easily group dynamics and group favoritism comes about from just being associated with a particular group. Go ahead. Uh, I, I totally agree uh, that groups have their own properties, but are those properties the same as um, the properties of individuals? Uh, so to talk about group psychology is, I think, a fair uh, thing to discuss, but anthropomorphizing groups is, I think, the move which he's calling out. And so is that also being falsified? I believe so. I think, you know, I think what it shows is that um, favoritism for your in-group and um, in-group can, of course, be come about mm-hmm. in multiple mm-hmm. ways. Right. Of course, in-group isn't always based on mm-hmm. race. It could be based on, you know, be, being a father, as you said, being a mm-hmm. soccer player, um, whatever it has you. But um, once the group is identified, um favoritism and bias towards your group is a very um, robust and (laughs) well-studied phenomenon. So regardless, so this could be one of the unintended consequences, right? But power dynamics and group relationships, um, or rather just power dynamics play themselves out at the group level, I think in particular for this reason, right? Because groups often don't even realize (laughs) that they're favoring members of their in-group, right? You could ask them and they're saying, no, I'm completely objective. But we just know from modern psychology um, that this is just blatantly false. Um, So interesting point. Let me, let me, let me uh, uh, agree and clarify. So um, let's use, uh, I don't think we've talked about the Nazis too much in our series of podcasts, but Uh, they're often just the easiest example to go, go with. Um, So good point. So if, if I am a member of the, um, uh, SS and I identify as a member of the SS, uh, and part of my group identity is, um, terrorizing, uh, uh Jews and gypsies and, and invalids. Um, then the group psychology is very much going to play, play a role. Uh, so you're, you're, you're totally right that group psychology, um, is an important thing and good counter example of me saying that you can't necessarily ascribe, um, uh, you can't anthropomorphize groups, uh, in some cases, you, you can. Um, I would say that the, a big distinction, though, is whether or not people within the group identify as a member of the group, um, or if this group uh, has been assumed by others outside it. So uh, the father's example is, I think, a good one, because um, in the U.S., uh, uh, the group identity, which is, I think, at most um, play, is is if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Um, and Right. If I was to say that, no, 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 the group identity, which is most at play, is if you're a father or if you're not a father, uh, and then assume that what's happening is based on a bunch of fathers all getting together and um, uh, wanting to represent the group uh, identity of, of other fathers, then the mistake that is made there is that I'm assuming uh, that people within the group identify as a member of that group. Um I would say that that's the same with like straight white men these days. I, um, I, I know that there are some people who 
identify as like straight white men and like the incels would be a great example of, of this typically straight white uh and very lonely men identify as as incels and then you get these group dynamics but the way that i hear this phrase being used is is um is i think making the same mistake as assuming that it's just a bunch of fathers all uh, uh, getting together under the identity of fathers because we don't know if that identity badge is the thing which is animating a lot of the decisions which people are making um so that would be my my my, my uh, clarification i don't know do you accept that or still think i'm making not, mistakes not entirely i take your point <laughs> to some extent but we do know that identity some identities carry more force than than other identities mm-hmm. and you cite an excellent example political identities in particular mm-hmm. in the u.s right now carry so much force that uh the the average person um the average democrat will just end up favoring, regardless of whether they think they're doing it or not, another Democrat in, per, for example, a hiring process, mm. right? And so to say that um, we can ascribe group dynamics by any situation by just finding the some similarity or whatever the characteristics in common, yeah, shared between yeah. some group is not entirely right. I think uh, there is some amount of explanatory power by identifying um, the the um, particular force of the shared characteristics by certain groups. But um, all I'm saying is I don't think Popper gives pays enough attention to um, tribal psychology and the possibility of um, sort of exploitative dynamics being born of power dynamics between groups. So while I f- certainly take his point that b- nothing can be fully explained by a group in power, um, it doesn't mean that nothing can be. Um, and I feel like he, he he sort of falsely asserts or falsely implies that that binary. Yeah, it, it's all, that's an excellent point. It's almost like um, he's implying that uh, one can never use groups to describe anything. Right. Uh, and you're saying that that is not uh, uh, that that thesis has been falsified through modern psychology and uh, in group um, uh, dynamics and stuff. Good point. Yeah, I totally agree. Cool. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where where were we? So, he ties his view of sociological theories to theory of tradition in the sense that a theory of tradition must address the question of how do certain traditions arise and what function do these traditions uh, play in society. And mm. that's what's going to lead him to a close analysis of one tradition in particular, uh, and that is the scientific tradition. And this is where I think the essay really starts to challenge a lot of the views that I had going into it. And this leads to the, what, the halfway point of the of the chapter? And so that's how um, that one strand is connected to what he's now going to discuss, which is um, the tradition of criticism, the critical, uh, critical tradition. So he's painting the tradition of criticism as slightly different than traditions that came beforehand, in as much that it is allowed to criticize itself So traditions that came beforehand laid out a set of rules, a set of um, conventions by which people should abide in order to fill in the blank, lead a good life, be moral, um, Mm -hmm. get married, whatever. Um, And and he's saying there's a role for tradition, but it's of a second order. And it is uh, precisely the role that allows it to criticize everything, because this is Mm -hmm. how knowledge is generated from him. So. Instead of trying to paraphrase him, let me just read a, a quote. Okay, so Popper says, My thesis is that we call is that what we call science is differentiated from the older myths not by being something distinct from a myth, but by being accompanied by a second order tradition, that of critically discussing the myth. Before there was only the first order tradition, a definite story was handed on. This second order tradition was the critical or argumentative attitude. It was, I believe, a new thing, and it is still the fundamentally important thing about scientific tradition. If we understand that, then we shall have an altogether different attitude towards quite a number of problems of scientific method. We shall understand that, in a certain sense, science is myth-making, just as religion is. You will say, but the scientific myths are so very different from religious myths. Certainly they are different. But why are they different? Because if one adopts this critical attitude, then one's myths do become different. They change, and they change in the direction of giving a better and better account of the world, of the various things we can observe. So, and, fuck, I love this quote. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, so, yeah. So just preceding that quote, he says that there's like, amongst the Greeks uh, and the Greek philosophers, it wasn't that they all of a sudden started 
just saying, let's understand things. They, they just started asking questions uh, where a myth is passed down. And then the question would be, um, can you give me a better account? And the other philosopher may answer, yes, I can. Or he might say, uh, I don't know whether I can give you a better account, but I can give you a different account uh, that does just as well. And these two accounts cannot both be true. So there must be something wrong here. We can't simply accept both of them. Um, we have to discuss it further. Yeah, yeah. I love how he just simultaneously debunks two camps of thought with this with this single quote. So on the one hand, he's arguing against the the person who says um, that science is not different than any sort of tradition. You might hear this more sort of the postmodernist camp these days, right? That says science is not capturing um, any more truth. It is not getting us closer to an objective reality than any other sort of tradition. You know, they're, they're not even, there's not even an objective truth out there, right? We, you know, all, all these sources are just language games. They're just definitions. They're just a subjective experience, right? Um, and he's, he's highlighting with this quote that no, like the scientific tradition is, is different from other sorts of tradition. But simultaneously, he's arguing against the, uh, the rationalist or, you know, as, as we were talking about last time, like the Bayesian who's saying science is, is completely distinct from myth making and creativity and human ingenuity. It's purely a matter of observation and numbers and doing a bunch of math and and having this mechanical machine that you put in observation, it spits out the right answer. You're saying, no, you know, science, it is based on myth. It's based on creativity of putting forward crazy ideas. But then the difference between that and any other tradition is is this second order tradition of criticism by which you you try and falsify all the bad ideas. And at the end, you're left continually with the best explanation at a given time. And, 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 not- and notice the, the talking about it as, let's say, like... Um, highly evolved myths immediately highlights the the fact that it's it's symbol independent it's language it's it's mm-hmm. it's about ideas at the end of the day it's not about following some axiomatization of what rationality should be and then spitting out rational answers it's 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 this uh, evolutionary approach that uh, at the forefront is all about ideas and explanations myths that then get challenged a little bit and start to account for a bit more and more until the theories of seasonality, which started by uh, just being posited by gods, end up being posited by like the earth tilt theory, where I won't go into it, but uh, the tilt of the earth coupled with the rotation around the sun explains the, the seasons. And that myth, like any other myth, is is completely open to criticism. If someone thinks that that's, something is being missed, then absolutely, let's, let's, let's criticize it. It's just that the chance of that having the property of truth associated with it is, is quite high. And therefore, it's most likely going to be resilient to any kind of criticism. But if someone thinks something is being missed, then criticize it away. And in this way, we, we start mutating these stories from primitive theology to sophist- uh, let's not say sophisticated, but to uh, uh, explanations which describe reality. Uh, and, and it's just a, it's a, it's a beautiful account. And I think that it is the one that makes yeah. the most amount of sense compared to all the other uh, um, accounts of, of, of uh, yeah. And then it, it, yeah. it's interesting because we start to see that tradition is actually required in this way for, for progress. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. Popper writes, traditions have the important double function of not only creating a certain order or something like a social structure, but also giving us something upon which we can operate, something that we can criticize and change, right? So it, it's the foundation of our knowledge at any given moment. Of course, it's open to criticism, right? It's open to falsification. And from that, we move forward. But it provides the status quo at any given moment of what our knowledge is at any given moment, right? And so if we were to, if we were to wipe the slate clean if we're to throw out tradition we throw out all that knowledge along along with it and and we have to start from anew we have to start afresh we have to build from the ground up Mm. um and so it's not glorifying tradition on the one hand as something we can't understand as something we can't change but it's not condemning it as simply something that's irrelevant now for making progress right it highlights Mm. the importance of tradition for us to actually move forward right for you know um, when we criticize something that's wrong about society, we're, we're criticizing something about tradition, something upon which we can approve. So if we if we were to throw out tradition, we're throwing out everything that we know is wrong, right? And now we're going to start with some initial blank slate, and we won't even know what's wrong with it, right? So we're, we're just ba- back at square one. Now we have to do the you know, we have to do more work and figure out what is wrong, and then start to criticize it again. Um, and so I just I just love how he he walks the line between the traditionalist and the rationalist here. Yeah. It's a bequeathing on to the next generation of 
uh, the knowledge and practices of the previous generation. And it, it's, it's not saying, here's what you must do, as the Burkean would say, uh, nor is it like, why the hell would I want this, as the, as the rationalist would say. But it's, it's, it's a bequeathing that says, take what we've done and improve it to the best of your ability and then continue mm-hmm. this, this, uh, this passing on. Um, and he talks about why this is so important, because there is this other tendency, I think, when people think about science as, as that it just can kind of be generated ex nihilo, where if we destroy all the traditions of the time, we can just start afresh and we don't need to, uh, to worry about carrying on what's come before us because we can always just start from the beginning again. But an important consequence of this view is that the tradition itself is important to pass on. And we, you and I didn't touch on this, uh, but in the essay, he talks about how traditions are very fragile things. In the beginning of the essay, he, he, he talks about how one thing that must be said at the onset with tradition is that it's very hard to move traditions, mm-hmm. to, to, to start traditions from scratch. Like the sociological theory portion highlights, traditions are unintended consequences. And so if the scientific tradition of criticism uh, is lost, if, if this process stops, it's, it's not at all obvious that it will start again. Um, and, and this is a hugely important point because, and it's one that I, I take personally, because the Greek tradition of criticism was lost mm. for a long time until it was picked up again in the uh, 16, 1700s at the beginning of the Enlightenment. And I take it personally because if it wasn't lost, we would be at frickin' Mars by now. <laughs> um, but, but for, for uh, what, 1700 years, or I don't know when you would actually demarcate this, but for a large period of time, it was lost and it, it just happened mm-hmm. to start again. And it makes, makes one realize that this little candlelight of the critical tradition is of the utmost importance to protect and to kindle and to, to pass on, because without it, everything uh, flops. Then we're just myth-making um, without direction, without uh, any sort of uh, notion of, of progress. And it it prevents one from being blasé about right. this because it is incumbent upon all of us to understand this tradition, to criticize it and understand its importance, and then try to pass it on to, to the next uh, generation. And like something I've been thinking about recently is that um, like when I am in the... Uh, university and i'm surrounded by people who are doing science most of them aren't doing science in the way that i think will actually lead to to truth um i don't do science in the way that actually will lead to truth very often because there's so many pressures there's just funding pressures there's pressures to join projects because you want to help out your friend um and people just go through the motions of of writing papers because Science is not just a pursuit of truth, but it's also a career and it's a set of behaviors and it's a lifestyle. And occasionally it is incrementally approaching, approaching truth. Mm -hmm. But the tradition of, of science, um, that phrase can be seen in two different ways. One is the tradition, which Popper is describing, which is the the thing that will actually lead to truth. Uh, And the other is just the habits of scientists when you go into a university campus. And the habits of scientists when you go into a university campus are informed by this tradition, but they are not the same as this tradition. And so like we're all waiting for a, a vaccine to come to just solve COVID. And it's like, we're all just waiting with our hands open for the scientists to drop this truth into our laps, but it doesn't work this way. Like the people in the uh, academia are working in many different ways, some of which are going to lead to knowledge about how to cure this virus, but bacteria, I don't know. Um, Coronavirus. And, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not coronavirus. Uh, but, but many of them aren't, and, and many of them are, are doing things that will promote their own career. And, and I'm not saying that I'm above this at all. Like I, I do this too. We all, we all do, but it was only with a kind of a careful analysis into what traditions lead to truth, lead to vaccines, and what traditions are started for other reasons, due to career advancement, due to the, just politics, due to human nature, due to the fallibility of, of all of us. Uh, and which of these traditions should I continue and which of these traditions should I try to shed myself of by replacing them with, with traditions that will lead to, to truth? And it's, and it's not at all easy, um, but it is important uh, because this 
second order tradition is such a frail little candle um, and we need to keep it keep it alight so yeah i think what's simultaneously refreshing scary and optimistic about popper's work is the role it imbues for each individual person uh, and not just for some elite right so it you know it this demonstrates that each individual person has a role in cultivating a tradition of criticism. If everyone but the scientists completely forego such a tradition um, and turn their backs on it, science as a process, as an institution, will will certainly collapse, right? And so this frailty is refreshing insofar as it gives everyone an important central role in maintaining it. But also scary because, our, you know, our ability to continually make progress is at the whim of the general population, right? Um, and mm-hmm. so it, it demonstrates, you know, it, it demonstrates the importance of each person as an individual actor in pushing us, Absolutely. pushing us farther forward. And, and I think the reason I say this is refreshing is because our language often reflects the role of... Um, you know, like you were saying, the scientists or the people making discoveries. Uh, we don't often talk about just the role of the average person in maintaining the tradition which enables oh this progress to be done, right? So it's refreshing in the sense that it's it's demonstrating how important uh, everyone is um, in our role yeah, in, and to, to move forward. But um, yeah. yeah, and, and there, there's just this um, almost complacency or paternalism and just people waiting for the scientists to, to save us from coronavirus. Mm. The word scientist makes it seem as if there is some people who can do this and other people who can't. And that is completely fallacious. Um, this is incumbent on all of us to criticize the stories that we uh, hear and pass on. Quote unquote, scientists do this sometimes and other times they don't. And there are friends of mine who are not quote, scientists, but are very critical and and careful to uh, promulgate anything which they haven't thought about deeply first. Um, And that's the thing that matters. Uh, Getting closer to truth begins with each and every one of us when we decide to communicate certain stories which we hear, uh, either through Facebook or on Twitter or in person. And when certain stories are communicated, for example, the shutdown STEM movement, Mm. which is one which has gotten very close to UBC, um, that says that all of science is just systemically racist and it's just about power games and all we need to do is is get rid of one group and put in another group. Um, Your choice to spread this or to criticize it is as consequential or arguably more consequential than if you had decided to go into chemical engineering or virology uh, in, in your undergrad. When you decide to shut off your critical faculties, you are directly contributing to uh, preventing this light from being passed on to the next generation. And so the the talk of scientists kind of irritates me because and it's not that you, you said that as is that in general people say well i don't need to do anything the scientists are working on it uh, as if as if there's some other people out there who are going to take care of this problem and you don't have a uh, responsibility here but you damn well do and your responsibility is to think critically of everything that you hear um and be careful to I, I won't say pass on only those ideas that are true because that's impossible but i will say just think critically and seek out ideas that you normally wouldn't seek out that's the most specific concrete thing that I can recommend people do is just find those who are your political opposites and read what they have to Mm -hmm. say, because you are going to find a lot of criticisms of your view that you might not like, but this is how you can directly contribute to, to, to helping uh, in this scenario. And we're not just, that's what I was saying in the uh, third episode of the probability. It's like, we're not just passive observers Mm -hmm. here. We're not just bystanders. We're not just onlookers. We're participants and we are participants in the sense that we're all intelligent critical human beings who have the capacity to skeptically and critically analyze ideas before we spread them and talk of scientists is a way to shirk this responsibility and say that somebody else is going to do it for me they're going to work on this but but we all have to so i just want yeah to i mean soliloquize on that because it's so important presumably yeah. though you're not ignoring the role that like expertise in a certain domain plays right so when you're criticizing this word scientist you're not saying some of us are better suited given our current knowledge to tackle certain problems than others i take it what you mean is that we all play a role in supporting in in or in laying the foundation which allows 
experts in a given field to continually make progress. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't even say that. No, like I um, the talk about experts. The best way I can think of it is uh, there's just certain problems which quote unquote experts will notice that other people won't notice. Uh, so I work in like uh, deep generative modeling and variational inference. Um, and there's some problems that I'm trying to solve there that uh, people who don't work in this field won't be aware of. And therefore, if you're not aware of a problem, you can't really contribute to helping solve it. But an, an expert, I don't think is someone who is any more capable than non-experts. It's just someone who's recognized a particular set of problems that other people wouldn't have recognized. It, like if I have to make a life decision, say, um, and I have one friend who is, say, a mathematics PhD, and I have another friend who is um, a roofer. There is no guarantee that looking at the mathematics PhD and asking them for advice compared to the roofer is, is going to be any better or any worse. Uh, it's just human beings problem solving at the end of the day. Um, and, and you can be closed-minded and dogmatic and ignorant and have a PhD. <laughs> and you can be open-minded and skeptical and critical and not have a PhD. Um, and so when I think about experts, I just think about there are some problems which are only really available to noticing after a certain amount of training in one narrow discipline. But they're not any more likely to produce truth than anybody else. They're just uh, aware of a different set of problems. Really? Okay. I think we might have an interesting disagreement there. I mean, presumably nice. with group theory, you're going to go talk to the mathematician. Let's say, right. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm going to sure. trust someone who understands the role of titration and the germ theory of disease and how, uh, and virology to understand the the science behind creating a vaccine more than I'm going to trust the average person, right? Um, to yeah. So there's like, <laughs> there's, there's a role um, for, there's a role for, there's, yeah. there's, let's say specialists. Um, of course, there's a role for, for yes. Uh, if, if I want to learn about, let's say, how my combustion engine works, I'm going to go and talk to a mechanic. Uh, and and they are a specialist in this narrow area, and they're likely to lead um, to, to more accurate information. Yeah. But if by experts one means like those who are less likely to be fallible or those who are um, who you should should turn to for every kind of question, then totally agree with that so so I, so we may be using terms terms differently yeah i mean i i don't think anyone is arguing that a given expert in a some sub specialization deserves a uh, like exalted role in uh, society deserves more weight yeah. on every possible question yeah. we could ask but presumably they do you know a, a, a specialist in virology does deserve more weight their opinion does deserve more weight on the question of producing a coronavirus vaccine than than you know than my voice does um and so that's all I'm saying, right? So totally people yeah. contribute yeah. to the foundation that allows people to make progress. But when it comes to expertise, we are going to trust the virologists to try and come up with the, <laughs> the vaccine. I, well, I wouldn't um, say we, like, we shouldn't trust them in the sense of not being critical of what they have to say. Uh, but we can agree that they are the ones who have picked up the the tools and are most adept at using these tools that are likely going to be uh, required to solve this this problem right exactly so what you're doing is using the letters in front of someone's names not as absolute authority but as a heuristic to denote when someone is actually more likely to have yeah, more resilient myths right and and that that is what we care about at the end of the day so you know what you don't want to do is create a situation where everyone can criticize everything mm. and you're not allowed to move on to the next problem until point. every single person is convinced um of of some fact of some axiom of 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 some myth right because because then we're, you know, we're, we're never going to make progress. So there is, there is a, there is a role for trust, I think. Oh, right? so nice. trust, it's, it's hard and it's hard to define exactly when to trust someone and when not to, but we do have to have some level of trust in experts to make the best decisions with the information they have. And what you do is trust the Get the set of experts in the same reference class, right? If they're working on the same problems with the same set of credentials to criticize yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. But if we're going to wait for every single person on the street to be convinced by Lemma 1.1 of the virologist paper, you know, we're, we're never going to get excellent. anywhere. Um, That's an excellent point. Mind officially changed on that one. That was, that was a good point. Um, and I realized that it's exactly what Popper's talking about here, which is it's like a tradition of trust um, where where mm. the uh, the use of the word heuristic, I think, really uh, emphasized uh, what I was missing, which is 
that like like there's a, a functionally infinite amount of myths we could trust. Or, sorry, criticize, and and we can't spend all day just criticizing everything. We need to just move forward in the world, and so we we kind of uh, offload some of that responsibility to people that we expect to be doing that right. for us. And point very much taken. This is just another example of like a tradition which has been passed on, but it's one which like from within the ivory tower, I don't see it being um, held up as much as it should be. Um, Like the fact that you and I have had to go into Popper's work, (laughs) which was written in the sixties to find a lot of these ideas. And they're not just uh, common knowledge. Like we shouldn't be learning about this now. We should have learned about this like at the beginning of, of our our scientific education. Um, And so point taken. Yeah. I would uh, just in closing here, I would, love to have a modern popper who could think through how to apply these ideas in as we were talking about earlier the era where we understand how people's like tribal psychologies kick into play so easily right so where which kinds of criticism you're ready to yield and which sort of um evidence you're ready to take on board as falsifying is so determined by um your upbringing, your values, your religious beliefs, all of these things. This is quite worrying, I think, right? Because, you know, if this chapter on tradition is saying anything, it's saying that together we need to uphold this this theory, this this um, tradition of criticism, right? And if we don't do that, then things can start to fall apart. And uh, certainly all of our criticism is very much directed towards those things we find worth criticizing, which in and of itself is very much determined by our identities and how we grew up and the values we hold and things like that. Um, so mm-hmm. I, yeah, I just, I do wonder how Popper would react to some of the finder, the findings in psychology around bias and group think and things like that. Um, because he's making some normative claims, but then there's just descriptive claims about how people actually reason in the world, what evidence they focus on, what, uh, sort of arguments they find convincing all of this. And so I think there's yeah. a whole conversation to be had about how we, proceed given these facts about our psychologies right i think we want to develop yeah, yeah. ways of criticism of institutions that can uphold um, methodology of progress regardless of our um psychological biases and our yeah. our less than perhaps optimal ways of regarding evidence we should maybe summarize what uh, what's been said and then um because we're almost at the end of the essay which is good because we're also almost at the end of the hour uh, too long. two hour mark um yeah but but uh but so oh the the main takeaways for me one is is that uh the role of tradition in our lives is by no means as simple as i when i first read this essay uh, had had thought the there is the need for a theory of tradition and I think that it's starting to be advanced. Yes, but a modern day popper. I think David Deutsch is the the mm. closest uh, modern day popper, and he he's advanced his theory through his analysis of of memes and and um, memetics, which we haven't gone into. Mm. But I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to read. I think chapter fourteen or fifteen of the beginning of Infinity when he talks about the evolution of culture, because um, sorry he he extends this idea. Um, so there's a need for a theory of tradition, um, and. His close analysis that Popper did of the scientific tradition was particularly relevant to me, at least, in the sense that um, it made me a- appreciate what it is that is going to lead to COVID vaccines. It's we can't just say the scientists are going to take care of this because, like, there's no other. Like, we we are in the ivory tower. Like, we are the scientists, and the only thing that's going to take care of this is conjecture and, and refutation. Um, and the, the the centrality of these ideas uh, cannot be overstated, then the last thing I'll say is, is just the one of the conclusions or the consequences uh, that we all have a role to play, I think, is, is something which is very important because what did uh, Kant say? Be roused from our dogmatic slumbers or whatever. Um, we, we cannot just be passive. We cannot be dogmatic. We have to be critical. And this is, I think, a good introduction to what the rest of conjectures and refutations um, uh, discusses. Yeah, nice. I wanted to argue about statues at some point, but I guess I don't think we have (laughs) have time for that. So in closing, I'll just say, because of the chapter, I've come to view tradition as just a problem to be solved. So tradition is able to be analyzed by our critical faculties. So while you shouldn't take tradition as God-given, it is not canonical. It is not something we should just listen to because it exists, but nor 
is tradition simply there purely arbitrarily? It, tradition is typically a result of groups of people who have come to solve a particular problem or what they perceived as a problem in a, in a, in a certain way. And so when you're analyzing tradition, you would analyze it as you would any other potential solution to a given problem. You ask, what are its origins? What kind of problem is it solved? Do we still have that problem? Is there a better way to solve this problem? Um, and so while you don't throw it out right away, you also don't, um, you don't act uncritically and towards it. And, uh, and yeah, so that is, is very enlightening for me in, in that respect. Excellent. This is a good uh, first chapter of the Conjectures and Refutation series. <laughs> um, I don't know what we're going to discuss yeah. next, but we'll have to talk about it offline and, um, and find, find one to follow up. But every single chapter is as rich as this. Oh, and I'll also say that I'll post just this chapter on my website or, or somewhere so people can, can, can get it because uh, oh, nice. it's easy yeah. to... Nothing we say will um, substitute for just reading yeah, the damn thing. Exactly. <laughs> just read it. Which you could do in under two hours. Yeah. So you could probably do yeah. that without just listening to us yeah. blabber on about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, this has been fun. I'm glad we started this uh, this new tradition of um, <laughs> analyzing Popper's, Popper's chapters. So it'll be good. Uh, someone's going to come across this episode and be like, why the fuck is this here? And throw it out. And be... <laughs> yeah. The Ch- Chesterton's podcast. <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Well, to be continued. Nice. Bye. Bye.